good morning. Good morning. My name is Jenny Rhodes. I work for the University of Maryland. I'm the extension agent uh, here in Queen Anne's County, and we would certainly like to welcome you to here to Queen Anne's County and to the Water Research Center. I'm your official welcomer for the morning. I want you to know that we have worked very hard to put together a great program for you today. Not only educational field day, but I think you're gonna see some cutting edge technology here today. And you're gonna hear from some local farmers. So make sure you uh, visit all the vendors. So when we talk about precision ag, you know, I think it, the def definition is very different for everybody. I looked up um, some definitions, so I wanna read a couple of them to you. Precision ag systems are agricultural information systems that combine geographical information systems, GIS, or global positioning systems, GPS, with guided information recording equipment um, capabilities on monitoring and controlling agricultural machinery, i.e. combines, uh, spreaders, sprayers, and now we're gonna add uh, drones to that list. We're going to add uh, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. I have learned a lot about that and I still have a lot to learn. And I looked up the NRCS uh, definition of precision ag and they talked a little bit about precision ag definition kind of decide that is determined by what technology is going on at the time. So while well, we all started um, with the little bubbles on the top of our tractors and now we've gone to auto steer and um, today we're going to be looking at uh, drone technology so a lot of different but anyway um, NRCS says precision agriculture is defined as a management system that is information and technology based is site specific and is used one or more of the following source data soils crops nutrients pests moistures, moisture, yield, for optimal profitability, sustainability, and protection of the environment. So I think that kind of really, really sums it up. So think about that today as you, as you go through the day. Uh, make sure that you got signed in. Uh, there are credits today, nutrient management credits for Maryland, Delaware, Virginia. If you're a certified crop advisor, there are credits for that, so make sure you see the registration tent also. Uh, if you didn't register online, I want to thank everybody for uh, the ones that went to online and registering. We're trying out some new, again, new technology on the extension side. And what we're going to do instead of having a paper copy of an uh, evaluation, in the next couple of days you're going to be receiving by email an evaluation. So we would really appreciate if you would fill that out, get that back to us. If you have any personal comments, please contact me because we want to build this and make this uh, a better field day every year. I want to thank the sponsors. We wouldn't be here today without our sponsors. We have our lead, uh, lead leadership sponsors, and they all contributed a thousand dollars a piece. And plus our vendors, they certainly all had to pay to be here. So make sure you take a look at your program. Uh, list all the sponsors. Our leadership sponsors were Armtech Insurance Services, Atlantic Tractor, Hoover Incorporated, Maryland Crop Insurance, Mid Atlantic Farm Credit and Willow Agri Service. But certainly, like I said, we couldn't have done it without everybody. There's a map in there that should tell you where everybody is. Please take time to visit with them today. They all have great ag services uh, for everyone attending. Uh, let's see, what else is on the list? Nutrient management credits. Uh, let me go down the list, make sure I have everything. So as you know, this is a, uh, a joint effort. We all, like I said, we all work uh, very hard. Uh, Dr. Josh McGrath, uh, who is now with, I hate to say this, the University of Kentucky. <laughs> so, but you, but you know, but you know what, you know what, Josh, so you're an expert because you're more than 50 miles away now. So we can, we can call you a official expert. So because of uh, Josh's expertise and his, uh, the people that he knows throughout uh, the United States, he has brought in really some great key speakers and you're gonna hear some really good uh, information. Uh, Sean Tingle that with the University of Delaware, uh, we work uh, close with them. And then here with everyone at the Y, you've seen everybody uh, parking cars and just working. Dr. Crowderville's, uh, Bob Crowderville's students are here working. Uh, Josh's students are here uh, working. Just everybody working together has pulled this off. And certainly 
Uh, you'll see all the ag agents from up and down uh, the shore here taking registration and working, and then my staff uh, in my county office, I could not uh, do that without them, especially Francis. You'll see him uh, riding around on the golf cart, so he probably keeps me straight uh, the most. So a couple other announcements coming up. The uh, University of Delaware is having an irrigation field day on Wednesday, August the 20th uh, from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, there will be some great information. Jim uh, Atkins has been in several of our programs and talked. He'll be There'll be a tour on subsurface uh, drip irrigation plots, variable rate center pivots, uh, soil moisture monitoring, and um, of course irrigated. He'll have corn, soybean, and wheat plots. So I think that'll be another great field day to head out to. All right, so I'm going to introduce uh, Josh. Josh, you want to come up and I'll let you introduce our first speaker and I'll get his presentation up. Hey everybody, how you doing? Uh, first thing I want to do is give a special thanks to Jenny. She really did so much work to put this together. This is the fourth year we've done this. How many people have been here before for the Precision Ag? A lot in the room. And I told her, I said, she waited till I left to actually turn this into a real professional affair. So let's give Jenny a hand for all her hard work. So the first speaker I'm going to introduce is Dr. Joe Luck. He's from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Uh, he was out here to speak about two years ago, year before last, I believe, the second year we held this, and uh, he decided to come back out and join us. He flew in late last night, actually from Kentucky. Uh, he should have just ridden over here with me, but uh, we weren't that coordinated. So with that, I'll just let Joe come up and, and talk to you. And I want to say... Notice on your program, we've got the farmer panel this afternoon, and for those of you that haven't been here before, the real point of today is to discuss and exchange ideas. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Our speakers are really great, have very good practical on the ground information. Uh, you know, at the end, we got plenty of talk. We don't have to time. We don't have to hold to this schedule. Uh, let's get some conversation going about these topics because I think that's how we learn. Joe? Well, thanks, Josh. Good morning, everybody. Um, please do. I, I would echo what Josh said. Uh, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be, be presenting this morning, um, some of the stuff that we're trying to teach producers working with ag data. If you have any questions while I'm going through this, please feel free to raise your hand and stop me and we'll go over it. And so can everybody hear me okay? A little bit more now. I want to thank the guys for setting the speakers up. They asked me to help, but you have to be able to count past 10. And it, that's always a challenge. I'm just an engineer. I use a calculator for everything. So, um, so as Josh said, I've been out at University of Nebraska now for about two and a half years. One of the things I like to focus on, I have a, a pretty big extension appointment, so one of the things I like to work with is taking precision ag data and showing producers through hands-on activities how to actually use that information. Uh, I think the research today has gotten quite a far away from us in terms of what we're actually able to do in terms of field data management and the tools that we have to analyze that data. And so one of the things that, that I like to do is try to pull that back in, look at some of the software that we have that are commercially available today and, and start showing people how to get a little bit more bang for their buck out of that information. So bear with me, I'm gonna throw a lot of stuff up here, but um, we'll, I'll, I'll promise I'll get through it without running over too much into the next person's time. So. Um, just a little bit of an overview here, you know, we've got, we've had precision ag variable rate technologies for several years now, and, and those things are, 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 are good tools to vary rate of, of crop inputs, but also one of the things that, uh, that we're, we're continually learning how to harness is all that information that's been collected and, and these technologies because they record spatially and the time and then product amounts and so forth, we've got a lot of opportunity here to collect all this data and actually use it. I'll probably mention this more than once, but calibration, having accurate data out of those systems is absolutely critical to, if we're going to do a, a analysis later on that's going to be worth it to us, we're going to get good information out of that. So you, you'll probably get tired of hearing me say that, but um, one of the things I want to kind of go through uh, a little bit this morning is something we do quite a bit out in Nebraska is with the Nebraska On-Farm Research Network. And what that is, is it's a group of extension educators and specialists and researchers that work with the farmers to put out plots on their fields and collect the data and actually analyze that data to give them better information about 
how some product or some practice is actually working on their farm. So it's really valuable. Um, it's always nice to see how it works in your operation. You know, there's costs associated with that, but, but it's a great way to learn new things and of course uh, extension activities like this, but, uh, but actually being able to get, get in with your practice is, uh, is, is really key for me. Just a couple of overview tips about, uh, about doing these. You know, you have to think about what question you're trying to answer what, and, and try not to overcomplicate things. So if you're, you know, if you're looking at uh, a hybrid, two different hybrids using the, the technology, and I'll show you an example of how we can do that later, you know, don't complicate that with hybrid versus uh, seeding rate, for instance, because you're going to have two different things you're trying to analyze, and it's really tough to get enough data to do that with. When we're doing field trials, oftentimes we've got a lot of complicating factors as it is, because we might have field terrain issues, we might have soil type issues and so forth, and those are natural variability that we, if we don't know any better, we can't really account for that in our analysis. So it's easy to, to end up having a study where you think you're looking at two or three different things and it turns out that you've, you know, you've got a, a four or five different factors in there. And so that's one of the things I just kind of try and point out here with site selection. If you're really looking at trying to test maybe a different product, it's really, really necessary to look at, you know, uniform area of a field where you don't have a lot of other things going on to complicate that test. So, you know, we're trying to limit those external factors in our plots. The nice thing is when we're using precision ag technology to, to collect some of this information is we're gathering all that as it is and we might actually be able to separate some of those things out. So we might actually be able to separate out maybe different soil types or, or, uh, or, or different maybe water holding capacity or something like that. If you are interested, I don't know, I don't know if a lot of folks up this way do um, a lot of partnering with on-farm research. We've got a lot of good information out on the Nebraska website about how to do this. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but you know, there, it's really important to set up your, your, your plots so that you're getting replications of that data. You know, you don't want to just do one strip of a, of a hybrid if you can. If you've got the space for it, putting in two or, or actually three or more strips, just so you have extra, extra data points to look at in there is, is kind of important. Um, another thing to think about is um, they talk a lot about, and I'm not an agronomist, but we talk a lot about, you know, having randomized plots across the field. So I'll show some examples of that later, why that's important, but, but actually trying to, to move those those strips around so that you don't have uh, the same order of your, your strips every time. And one of the other things that's really important about doing your research, if you're going to do it on your own farm, is having some kind of check strip. And I know nobody likes to go out and put zero nitrogen down and leave a strip without nitrogen, but you know that could actually be pretty valuable information if you have the opportunity to do that because you know you might have really good mineralization one year or something like that, and you might have a really uh, a pretty good yield and you might not put down any nitrogen at all. We've seen that several times. Um, I won't go into too much detail about the data collection, but the nice thing is, you know, the technologies that we have are recording all this data in general, whether you know it or not. If you're using some type of VRA equip equipment, even if you're doing section control or something like that on a planter or a sprayer, you're probably actually recording all this information and it's on the monitor somewhere. Sometimes it's nice to visit that site throughout the year, maybe take some extra notes and pictures and so forth, just in case things come up later when you're doing your analysis, maybe you can go in and, and kind of troubleshoot and figure out why some of those things happen. So um, that, that's always just a, kind of a good practice with this stuff. I could talk probably for the rest of the time about yield monitor data quality, but you know, yield monitors have been around for 20, 20 years now. Um, have the ability to collect really good information with that, but if you're not taking the necessary precautions to calibrate those, you know, every year, at least doing a check every year per crop, things like that, you're probably taking a risk of not having good data out of that system. And one of the, uh, one of the examples I'll give here is a, a yield calibration, uh, two-point yield calibration, which was uh, typical of the, the older Green Star systems on deer. And what we did was we took a calibration point here, a low calibration point, around 15 bushels per minute. We took another calibration point up around 45 bushels per minute through the elevator. 
and uh, and when we we ran several more flow rates through that system you can see what the error looked like so everywhere in between those two points I was overestimating yield and anytime I had flow rates above or below my two calibration points I underestimated the the crop yield in those areas and that's because you know with a two-point calibration you're limited and the response from those yield monitor systems impact plates are nonlinear so you've got this kind of effect going on now Ag Leader for several years had a multi-point calibration where you could do four to six calibration loads and we really recommend if you've got the opportunity to do that do at least four loads for your calibration so you can start to, to put some extra data points in here and get that that type of error out but if you're going to use precision ag data to do your test plots and, and yield monitor the data in, in, in particular, you know, you've got to do everything you can to make sure you're getting good data. Um, I mentioned before, you know, we can automate a lot of the data collection. W you know, we can get out of the monitors now. We can get as applied planning, chemical application. We can record where things were applied, which again, I'll show some exam examples later. And the one thing I would point out is, you know, in the past, the software to do this type of analysis was really cumbersome, and it was really tough to set up an analysis. Well, a lot of the, the software that we have available to us today, SMS from Ag Leader, FarmWorks, uh, SST is another example, they're getting a lot better at helping us automate this data analysis. So instead of having to go in and do things manually, I can actually go in, set up an analysis, and run that analysis over separate fields and not have to do it every time. So things are getting easier with this and I'll show some examples of, of that as well. I just wanna point this out. This is one of the examples I go through when we're talking about, you know, where am I gonna put a study plot in my field if I wanna do something, maybe test one variable, maybe two different hybrids. One of the things I look for is I go back and look at the old yield monitor data and I'm trying to pick out places like this zone three right here where I've got pretty stable yields across the field. You know, I went back and checked soil survey map and I'm in the same soil zone here. So one of the things I don't want to try and do is I don't I don't know what was going on. Actually I do know what was going on here. This is a drainage issue. We've got a couple low spots here that don't drain. I don't really want to put my plot in those areas because I'm going to in introduce some other variability into that study plot that I don't really want. So you know, any other type of information that you can look at, um, aerial, soil maps, and so forth, historical yield, it's always a good idea to try and get in there and, and, and make sure you're putting that study somewhere where you're going to get good data. Um, just a few tips on, uh, on con conducting these. A lot of companies are going to using yield monitors now. They're getting away from using uh, grain carts with weigh scales on them for their for their uh, data collection, going to totally using yield monitor technology. Um, you know, if you're gonna use a yield monitor, your plot, the strips, they have to be at least two or 300 feet long, you know, because as most of you have run yield monitors, you know it takes some time to load that machine and you gotta get it good, loaded and go through this plot. Now you set that, you set your lag time so that the points are offset where they need to be but it's still to get enough good data points in that area, you really need to have some pretty long strips. So, you know, keep that in mind. We, we get a lot of smoothing because of the yield data uh, that we get out of these systems. Uh, some other things we can do is when you're collecting yield data, if you know where your harvest area is gonna be, you know, set that up as a different load in the monitor. And I'll, I, can, I can give you an example why that would work. But another thing that, that we kind of talk about is, is cleaning yield data but trying to get some of the errors out and probably a lot of you have seen errors you know some of the biggest errors are cut width when you get into point rows you start losing the yield starts dropping the average because of that cut width not being corrected but I'll just give you another example here of a field uh, this was actually on one of our research farms last year and I don't know if we had a header sensor failure or the operator was just not picking the header up at the end of the field, but, but he actually recorded uh, yield data every turn around this field, and it was recording zero yield for that. And so if we just kind of blindly go and put that into an analysis, or we blindly go and put that into a nitrogen recommendation, all of a sudden my expected yield in those areas is 
averaging out much lower because I, ha I have valid data points or at least the software thinks they're valid and there's zero yield there and those are just getting overlaid on legitimate points. So uh, there's actually a neat tool from USDA called Yield Editor. I don't know if anybody here has used that or not, but it's a free software package. The only bad thing is you have to have SMS to export, and, uh, to export the files uh, because that's the only software that they support right now, but, but we're hoping they do some updates on that. But it's a really good tool for automatically removing a lot of these errors. Uh, we have a lot of other data out there. Obviously, we already talked about that, but uh, one of the examples I'm going to show in here a second is, uh, is using split planner hybrid data that was, ge that was recorded geo-referenced with a, with a Green Star monitor. And I like that data because depending on your GPS accuracy, you know, the location of where we're putting the hybrids is a pretty good data set. We could talk about seeding rate later, but, um, but you know, we need to really think about if we're going to use, for instance, a seeding rate, um, using our precision technology to vary seeding rate and do a strip plot on that, we probably need to go out and do a little verification and make sure that the planter was doing what we asked it to do in terms of planting rates out in the field. Uh, the last thing I'd point out there is, you know, we want these things to change a seeding rate at this point in, or this line and you know the, these systems take time to respond so that things aren't happening just like that when we want them to in the field. The um, thing I'll point out here is if we set up some kind of analysis we could have the best analysis in the world if we put bad data into it we're not going to get any good information out of it. So there's two different things to think about there we really want to be able to make sure we have quality data when we do these type of studies. And, you know, statistics, well, it's always nice to work with somebody that's got some experience with that. That's at least what I like to do. Um, and so in terms of our on-farm research network, that's one of the benefits of doing that is we actually have, you know, researchers and educators with a lot of experience in setting up how to analyze that to make sure that we're actually seeing a legitimate difference in those treatments, so whether that might be a, a nitrogen treatment or a hybrid or so forth. And in the end, when and, and at least in our network, we always try and tie it back to the economics. So I might have gotten a five bushel per acre increase with this different product, but what was the cost of that product? Not just the, the dollar amount assigned to it, but you know what's the cost of going out and actually doing that? If I have to make a a separate pass across the field to do that, you know, I need to take that into account too because it's not just about getting a yield bump. In the end, you want to be profitable when you, uh, when you do these. So anyway, that's one of the, uh, th that's kind of one of the goals of the, the on-farm research network that we have. And I guess the kind of the thing that I would say about that is um, you might have management practices that are different from your neighbor and you might have two fields that are identical, but because of the way you manage that, you know, you might have differences, you know, product might respond differently. So if you're doing, you know, like you guys, probably a lot of you doing in-season nitrogen, um, placement method, all those kind of things. So one of the nice things about doing these studies in your fields, in your management operation, it, it'll give you some powerful information. Um, so what I thought I would do now is go through some different examples of some of the data that we we try and show people uh, and and I'll kind of point some of these out as uh, challenges and opportunities so this is one of the challenges uh, that, that I want to point out here we had a field and this is uh, pesticide application rate so I'm actually going in and I'm looking at the as applied sprayer files here and my, if you guys can see this in the back, my target rate uh, was, a, was 10 gallons per acre. And even the monitor is telling me that I did not hit 10 gallons per acre everywhere in that field. In fact, more often than not, my error, so I was somewhere above 11, 11 gallons per acre. So that's a 10% difference. You know, I've got this rate, this range set here, 11 to 15. It could all be 11.01 for all I know, and that's one of the things you really need to appreciate when you're, anytime you look at a scale like this, it could be 11.01, it could be 14.99. You know, you don't know that from looking at the map. But, you know, for a, a, about a 45 acre field, you know, only 35 acres was sprayed 
within my plus or minus 10% of my target rate. And now that's just based on the entire boom. One thing to point out here is the system really, you know, we have these pretty, pretty big sweeping turns here uh, for, you know, a 90 foot boom and the, the computer doesn't register any difference across the boom. It continues to treat that as if it's the same application rate on the inside of the turn or the outside of the turn. So, you know, that's another challenge with this information. You know, am I getting, am I getting good weed control on the outside of the boom when I'm turning? Am I over applying too much on the inside? You know, these are things that, that, uh, that we have to think about. This could be tough to see, and, and, and I apologize if it is, but, uh, you know, here's some examples of some yield data. This is one of the things I want to point out. If you can see this, I've got these red and green bands here. Those are actually my split planter data. So I'm recording hybrid A. It was put into the, the right six units and, plant, and hybrid B was put in the left six units. I can set that up in the monitor to track that. And, and what you see within those, those coverages right there are my yield data points from the yield monitor file. And I can actually use the software now pretty easily to go in and extract those yield values from those two different hybrids. And, uh, and, it, takes a, and it takes on average about 45 minutes to an hour to set that analysis up. But in other words, I can go back now and I can run that analysis on other fields if I've done a similar study. So this is a good example. If, if we've done a good job of calibrating our yield monitor, we have good yield data. I'm pretty confident as long as I put the hybrid in the right side of the planter and I set it up right in the monitor, then I'm going to get pretty good information from this because I'm just looking at where the hybrids were planted. And another thing is, you know, if you're doing a split planter trial like that, you know, you're getting data spread across the entire field. One of the things we cannot do easily right now is if I had maybe two soil types, you know, cutting through this field separating those two sets of data out and maybe looking at hybrid performance versus yield, you know, versus soil type. And that's still where we're, we're still in a, a challenge area right now in terms of software and getting the software to do that for us easily. So here's a, here's a closer view of that. And again, you can see um, as I'm making those turns, I'm actually getting two strips of uh, 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 basically a complete planter width of one hybrid and, uh, and then my, my yield data within each one of those strips. So I did mention that we, we can't do two of those, uh, separate two of those at once, but if I'm looking at one thing at a time, here's another example of, uh, and, and this is all real data, in, and we're actually using SMS software from Ag Leader. I've pulled in a soil map here in our CS soil boundary. I've got my yield data file here, and you can kind of still see the outlines, hopefully, of those soil boundaries there. And what I can do with the software is I can go in and extract those yield values within soil groups. Or if I had another data layer, just like the hybrids, I can go in and pull that information out. So in the past, and with some sets of software, for instance, uh, Apex from Deer, you know, I still have to go in and select this area manually and, and look and see what my yield was in that area. Well, with, with some of the new, newer softwares that are being updated, I can actually go in and set that analysis up and have it pull them out automatically. And that's what you see here in this table at the bottom. Um, we're looking at these, these several different soil types across the field, but I'm getting average yield values from those uh, different soil, in those different soil zones. So I'm actually quantifying that difference now uh, instead of maybe getting a, a educated guess at it. And one thing I would point out is, you know, we use soil survey boundaries a lot, but, but this is probably not a good boundary. There's an area here that more than likely, just based on looking at the yield data, that soil boundary is not correct. So one of the things I'd like to do with this information is, if I've started out with management zones based on soil type, I can actually go in now and use that yield data to kind of tighten up those zones so I don't have so much variation. And we also get a little bit of extra information out of this analysis. We also get maximum and minimum yield estimated in each one of those soil zones. So I can look at that and see, you know, what's my spread in yield versus that average yield? Is this soil, is this zone I've set up, do I want to use this zone 
to try and manage everything from seven to 90 bushels per acre, well, maybe I need to go back in and do some type of adjustment and come up with a better zone. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of using you know, yield data to try and set up management zones if possible. This is an example of, uh, of some as applied nitrogen data, liquid nitrogen. Um, I think we were shooting for about five gallons per acre. And again, if you check out this, this range here that I've got, this thing's all over the board. Um, but, but for five gallons per acre, still I'm doing a really good job. And again, these, these values in red, they could all be 4.8 gallons per acre, which actually would be pretty good. But you can see in the data a lot of areas where I've got some issues going on with actual application rate and the monitor's not it's doing its best job to estimate these for us based on flow meter and distance travel and so forth but um, I could actually see you know starting into the field and speeding up and a, a lot of this is probably due to acceleration I'm, I'm not actually putting down the exact rate of nitrogen that I want to so this is just another uh, example of that data and you know, one of the things I just want to point out is, can I go back and look at this and see if, if potentially maybe a, a plot that I put out, did I affect that somehow based on what my as applied nitrogen rates look like? And if we want to use this information to do nitrogen rate studies, just like with the planter data, we could actually go in and do that if we want to. So here is, uh, here's another field. This is a, a producer field out in Nebraska. What we've got here is our as applied planter data and notice that it's not anything that looks like the, the a solid rate. We've got variation in that rate. Um, I think our goals were 28, 30 and 32,000. But the planter is telling us that I'm not holding that rate perfectly. And I think we need to appreciate that. You know, the technology can do a lot of neat things, but it's not perfect. And this particular field has got a slope that kind of runs uh, on the uphill side on the east over to the west and it kind of goes down into a, a pretty low spot there and this was in 2012 which was the drought year and it's not irrigated so what the of course the the it was planted before the drought but what the producer was trying to do was see if they could reduce their rates across the field and so they did their highest rate in the low spot and were kind of stepping it down and if we go back and actually look at the yield uh, based on some different target rate ranges, we actually do see that the more seed he put down in those areas that had more soil water content actually did out yield the ones up on the hill. But again, that's kind of intuitive, but, uh, but we can actually go back and look at that information and, and figure out the actual values now of, of how that yield performed or that seeding rate. So, this is, uh, this is the actual target rate. And I believe on this field, the, the producer was changing that in the monitor. So the monitor just recorded what's my target rate gonna be. And you can see that, that rate change here as, as we go down the hill. Um, now in terms of a, a study on seeding rate, you know, a, a research study to see that, is that a good a good way to, to conduct that test or to lay that test out. I'll, I'll throw out another example. Here's an example the the same guy set up this plot over here and uh, and and set this up. Here's his target rates 32, 36, and 40 and these strips across the field. Who's, uh, who's going to set a strip plot up like the one on the left? Okay, what about the one on the right? So this is just what we're talking about, and a lot of you guys have probably got experience with this, but you know, this, this is, is randomized, it's replicated. I've got several strips now. I can go back in and look at my yield in those areas with those different seeding rates. This one, all I'm gonna know is the more seed I put out, the more yield I got from it. But it's not because of my seeding rate necessarily, it's actually because of the natural variability in that field. So I don't see that even though I'm using this technology to try and evaluate it, I'm not, you know, I might see what I want to see there, but if I go back and plant the highest rate across that entire field next year, my yield's going to suffer. So um, it's really important to kind of understand how these things are set up and are, and are we getting good data. And I don't know if I have, I don't have the results of this 
particular field study, but basically what this one told him was he sees about a five bushel per acre increase going from 32,000 to 36,000. When he goes up to 40,000, there's no yield difference uh, across that entire strip. So for him, that extra seed resulted in no, no actual yield bump. So uh, really good information. And, and we actually, uh, so, so the reason I was in Kentucky was we were actually doing a workshop showing people how to take this, you know, step by step, how to take this yield data, how to take the planter data and go through the process of, of building that analysis. And so we actually just went through how to do that yesterday. Um, another thing that, that we haven't been doing a lot lately that, that these systems give us the ability to do is, you know, I've showed you some maps that show what my target rate was going to be and then what my monitor told me the as applied file should have looked like. And a couple of opportunities I think we have with this information is so, you know, if you look just for instance at this one on the bottom, this is the as applied uh, sprayer file. You know, first glance, I look at this and I'm, I'm thinking, man, I've got this area of the field here. I really over applied pesticide in that area. Well, then I go back and I look at the target rate map. So again, uh, the operator changing this in the monitor on the go. And it was actually purposefully done to increase the target rate up in this area of the field. So I think there's a couple of opportunities here. One is we can go back and see, okay, this is what I told you to do, and this is what you did, and we can set up an analysis pretty quickly to, to show us the differences in those two. Uh, the other thing that's really helpful is the opportunity to train uh, operators to, to not try and, and make some of these errors. And, uh, and, and again, we don't see any variation across this spray boom when we're making turns, and we know that that's not reality. Um, and until we get a little bit more detailed mapping like that, you know, that, that's something that you just have to, uh, you have to appreciate and understand. <clears throat> so I've talked a lot about uh, data quality and why it's important to have good data. It's really good if you're going to do some type of analysis, if you're going to look at, you know, seeding rates, hybrids, and you're using that yield data file. Um, and now I'm going to show you an example of why that's important. In, in Nebraska, you know, they've developed an equation to predict nitrogen, and it's based on a few different factors, uh, uh, expected yield, organic matter, and so forth. And if we applied that, that based on a yield data for our expected yield, and what I did here was created a 50-foot grid, so those are the grid cells you see, if I take a raw yield data file and just dump that information in as my expected yield value, I come up with a certain recommendation. And if I go into that same yield file and I pull out a lot of errors that I know exist in that yield data file and then build a separate map off that and look at the difference in the two. So this is, this is the difference between those two maps. Uh, this is actually what I see. And what we're looking at here is a, a, a nitrogen difference in terms of pounds per acre. These red areas are, are 15, a greater than 15 pounds difference. So there's several of those around here. Uh, there's some dark blue areas in this, this place right here. And that's, that's underestimating the nitrogen that I could have applied in that area. And why is that happening? Well, it's, a, it's an artifact of my yield data, my yield monitor error. In all these places, these small places where we're seeing a lot of red are areas where during the harvest the operator had to stop pretty quickly. And when you do that, the yield monitor always records one or two points of really high yield. And I don't know if any, anybody in here has seen that before, but if I, if I have that, even if I don't look at individual data points and I create a grid out of that, those really high data points affect the grid cells around it. So this is what we're, this is what it looks like in the end. And in, and in particular, in some of these areas here where you see a lot of underestimation of nitrogen, that's because of cut width there. So, you know, I'm going into a point row or coming out of a point row. My cut width's still full, but I'm not harvesting as much crop. And so I'm estimating yield lower in those areas. And so, um, this is just one example of 
if I ignore those errors and just blindly stick this information into some type of analysis, there's p potential to see that down, you know, later in my analysis or my management process. So, you know, going from one data set, putting it into an analysis and going into the next data set, that error, can, you know, it, it could potentially continue through that. So, I guess the, the point of that is, you know, just be very careful with the information you're using. You know, 10 or 15, 20 years ago, this might not have happened because I might not have had an automated equation uh, building process. I might have been generating these manually based on, you know, assigning rates to these different areas of the field, which, which you can still do. But these automated analysis tools give, gives us the ability to build an algorithm or build an equation, run lots of sets of data through that, and then generate you know, prescription maps for different nutrients. So just one of the dangers there. Um, a lot of people are asking now and are talking now, everybody's interested in ag data. A lot of companies, um, and, and a lot of them are talking about analytics, you know, the big data in agriculture. And one of the issues with analytics is, and at least in terms of what some people are talking about is, I'm gonna take 20 different data sets. I'm going to take yield data, planter data, nitrogen applied, soil maps, terrain, all these different layers. I'm going to lay them on top of each other and then I'm going to pull information over that specific point or that specific cell and I'm going to tell you what affected the yield in that cell. Well, if I just take four different data layers and this is yield data and then I put my soil map data on there and then maybe I put my nitrogen application data on there, and then maybe I put my planter as, a, as applied or my directed planting data. Um, the problem is what might have affected the field in one area could be caused by nitrogen or it could be caused by terrain or soil type. That might not have affected the field in another area. And I think what, they're gonna, what you're gonna see is, especially depending on how small of a, a, a area you're looking at, you're just going to see these huge averages of data that say, uh, well, everything affected yield, so what do you do? Um, I think the jury's still out on that one, but that's one of the things I worry about because, you know, maybe we could see in some of these areas, maybe, maybe it was nitrogen uh, over here. Uh, over here in this area, I've got really good yield, and I had low, I applied low nitrogen again. So, you know, how do you separate those things out? I think a better method is really to look at it from a diagnostic perspective and each, you know, you kind of have to pull these things out separately and look at them and, and figure out what affected things. So that's, that's one of the approaches that, uh, that I would, I kind of recommend for that is this, you know, diagnostic approach, take the year, look at what different things might affected, you know, how is that going to improve your knowledge for the next year. So. <clears throat> Uh, I guess just to kind of summarize things, and, and I think I've left some time for some questions, but uh, I, I think the, the technology, it, it's not perfect, but it's going to give us opportunity to do a lot of uh, neat things specific to your operation if you're collecting that information. And the software is getting a lot easier to work with. I think a lot of the software developers are seeing the need for that, and so uh, what we're finding is we can get people trained in probably about an hour to understand how to set up, you know, extracting yield data versus soil type and use that information a little bit better, you know, yield data versus hybrid and so forth. And so, um, and the only other thing I would say was uh, regarding uh, equipment calibration, you know, the planters, they do a good job of rate changes, but you need to go back and kind of verify that you're getting the seeding rates that you, that you requested. Uh, we know that the, the things aren't going to change on a dime out in the field. And in fact, you know, they're set up, every one of those systems is set up to respond to speed change throughout the field. So if you make any type of uh, acceleration or deceleration, you're, you're changing the, the, the seeding rate just by doing that. So um, it takes time for those systems to compensate. And then again, if, uh, you know, if you're interested or you have questions about you know, how to do on-farm research, I'm sure a lot of folks in here have worked with researchers, you know, especially with some of the nutrient issues that you have here. Um, let me know. I'd be glad to visit with you. And we're working on getting a lot more detailed information out, in particular with how to use, how do I actually use step-by-step, -step, 
you know, the software and the hardware to, to answer some of these questions based on all the data that I'm collecting. So um, I'm, I think I'm a little bit early, but if, if there's a question or two, I'd be glad to answer it. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about the yield monitor calibrations. You know, you've got usually early in the season, you've got high moisture corn. Later in the season, as that dries down, you've got lower moisture corn. And, and what's the cutoff for that? Uh, when do I need to do, uh, I, I guess part of the question is, do I need a separate calibration? And I think most people would shake their heads and hear, yes, you've probably seen that error occur. Um, there is no set point for that, unfortunately. You could do, you know, you could do two. I, I, I usually recommend people do at least two. You know, try and do one if you're down around 18%, something like that, and that's going to get you that lower range. It depends on where you're going to end up with your moisture. You know, if you're going to harvest down at 13%, try and get something closer. You know, maybe up, maybe like something around 15, 16, 21, 22 to try and capture some of that higher moisture corn. But it's, it's definitely worth it. You'll see an improvement in the data if you do uh, that separate calibration. Yeah? When you did your strip trials, you said you were using a 12-row planter and you were filling half and half. Mm -hmm. Were you using a six-row head to pick it? Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, and, and if there's uh, uh, agronomists in the room that wants to shoot me over this too, you can. But, you know, mo most times, so the question was, uh, we had a 12-row planter, six rows were hybrid A, six rows hybrid B, and then, and that's where we're getting our, you know, our 12 rows just making normal passes through the field. We did have a six-row uh, header on the combine, and that, that brings up a good point in terms of you have to consider your equipment when you do this type of test. So just... For instance, if I had a 12-row header and I just start on the north end of that field and harvest to the south end, my data is worthless because the first six rows were planted in hybrid A and then from that point every 12 rows were hybrid B and, and, and so forth. If I've got a 12-row header, I've, I'm harvesting both at the same time now. So you have to think about that. You know, What would you do in that case? Well, you, I would probably harvest 12, harvest 6 and then get on my hybrids. But if your, your harvester's half the width of your, your uh, planter like that, it makes it a little bit easier. Except, in general, when we set up a plot, and so I'm, I'm kind of interested in doing uh, collecting some data on this. In general, if we had 12 rows of, of a certain hybrid and 12 rows and 12 rows, in general, we would want to harvest the middle six rows of each of those, right? because we want to try and, and minimize any interaction between hybrid A and hybrid B, you know, if there's cross-pollination issues like that. Uh, I honestly don't know how much of a difference that's going to make in yield monitor data, but, uh, but that's also something to consider. Um, we are collecting a lot of data points with the yield monitor data, and, um, and so I guess it'd be interesting to see if there's really much you can pick up because, you know, keep in mind with your yield monitor, it, with the current systems, the impact plates, which are the most popular uh, ag leader and deer, if the entire field is within one to three percent of scale weight from the yield monitor to the scale, you've done a good job. But that doesn't mean that this point's going to, in fact, you can see that this point's not going to be within 1 or 3% of the point before it. You know, point to point, yield monitor is going to have some variation, but the ability to average those points over a long enough a distance is what we're looking for. And, and again, my absolute yield value is probably not going to be too accurate, but in, in terms of a, a comparison like this, 
the, the variation between the two, we should be able to pick that up pretty well with the, with the yield monitoring system. So, but a great point about the equipment set up and actually, you know, going in and, and conducting the test. And of course, we would, that would throw a red flag immediately in this situation though, because if I had a 12 row header, all of my yield monitor points would be right down, you know, in between my, my two different hybrids. And so hopefully if I actually looked at the information, I'd see that. Good question. What else did I forget? There's gotta be tons of stuff. No other questions? Well, I, I appreciate the time. Thanks for uh, letting me come back and visit. If you know, we'll be around the rest of the day. If you do have any questions about any of that, um, and again, one of the things that we're really interested in is uh, is you know going out and teaching people how to use the software because I, I still feel like that's one of the really important parts of the process is you know connecting the field and the office and and how do I actually do that? You know, not just talking about it, button pushing and stuff. Uh, how do I do it and how do I do it appropriately? So, you want me to introduce the next person or I can, no, I. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thanks, guys.